We end our course with dying, which of course is the end of life. When we talk about dying and death, one thing we have to understand is that we look at it culturally very different. Basically, in some cases, we use death as an analogy for something or something that's good or bad. But we do find that death and bereavement and all those aspects tend to be very different from culture to culture. Um, as you see in the pictures down here, we have three very different ways we celebrate perhaps or we show about death. So the first one is sort of a traditional New Orleans jazz festival. The second one you may not have heard about. It's kind of fun to look up in Guyana. The people have customized coffins made that represent a lot of who they are throughout their lifetime. So in this case, it was a fisherman who had that coffin made. And then the last one is a pretty traditional Catholic funeral service in a church. Cultures really do view death very differently. In some cases, it's a celebration of the beginning of another life, if you want to think about the Egyptians. In some cases, it's a celebration of a life that's been. In some cases, it is about bereavement, about the passing of a person. But let's look at the more clinical aspects of death, and you do need to understand what each one of these is. For clinical death, we're basically talking about a lack of heartbeat and respiration. So that's what you see here in this picture. This person no longer has a heartbeat, no longer has a, a respiration. They would be considered clinically dead. Now, we bring people back from clinical death all the time. This is when we say people came back from the dead. It's normally from clinical death, whereas whole brain death is very different. It's a irreversible loss of function. Basically, the brain has died. We don't see any more EKG wave patterns. And in our next one, we'll look at the difference between um, a whole brain death and some of the other ones. I love this image because what it shows us is the glucose metabolism study. And people quite often ask me, you know, so we got persistent vegetative state, we've got whole brain death, we've got clinical death, what are they different? Well, as we already said, with clinical death, it's just simply the heartbeat and the lungs have stopped breathing, but we can get them back from that. When we start talking about whole brain death or we're talking about persistent vegetative state, how do we know this? It all has to do with the amount of activity that we see within the brain. So when you look at these three images that we have here, this first image right here, let me use a different color that didn't show up very well. Let me use yellow. This first image right here is showing a normal brain. Now, how they do this is that they use glucose. Basically, this PET scan, which is quite commonly used in psychology or in the study of the brain, is what we do is we have somebody take a pill that has a slight radiation in it we know is what the brain eats is glucose. So an active brain like this first one, we would see a lot of lighting up because the brain is active and it's consuming energy. Whereas in this second image, we definitely see whole brain death because we see no more activity inside the skull. It's a very common image when we know that there is whole brain death. Whereas with a persistent vegetative state, you can see there is some activity, but the activity is very minor. Basically, what we're going to see is, is that we only have enough activity to keep the body alive. And that's how we know that you're in a persistent vegetative state. So if you ever want to question, you know, how do we know my aunt or uncle is in a vegetative state, they can do a PET scan and they can look at the actual brain activity of the person. Bioethics is something that has become more popular, you might say, in the last 20 years. Um, as we began to have more ethical questions and decisions about our life and what constitutes a good life and a bad life, bioethics is what's really kind of occur. Now, bioethics also is something that we look at when we talk about keeping people on ventilators or keeping people um, in certain living conditions. Bioethics is basically an offshoot of some court decisions that were made. Um, there was a young lady named Karen Ann Quinlan, and Karen Ann Quinlan unfortunately um, took a combination of medications that she was given and then went and had a drink with some friends and went into a persistent vegetative state. Her parents fought to have her taken off the respirators. And we'll talk a little bit more about her later on. Um, but 
she's the first one who basically got the right to do that. And that's sort of where bioethics begins as far as a study is concerned, because we do feel that people have a right and an individual freedom here in the United States to make certain decisions about their lives. Which brings us to euthanasia. Now, we do distinguish euthanasia in the United States into two types, active and passive. Now, active is deliberately ending one's life. Now, one thing we must understand is that in order for it to be euthanasia, it must be the ending of one's life because they have a terminal illness and they're not going to come back from that. So not all suicides would be euthanasia. If I'm perfectly fine body, but I am depressed and decide to kill myself, that is suicide. However, if I have a degenerative disease and I'm at the end of that degenerative disease or I have cancer, let's say bone cancer, which is extremely painful, and I decide that toward the end that I am suffering and decide that I want to eliminate um, living anymore, then that would be active euthanasia because I am ending my life based on taking something. On, I've made this clear statement, but I also have no way of coming back. This isn't like I'm, I'm going to be able to get back from bone cancer. Where passive euthanasia is basically my desire not to continue treatment. Um, quite often, older people who may have kidney disease um, decide that they are going to stop dialysis. Um, basically, without dialysis, they're going to die. But they say, you know what, I'm 89. I'm really tired. I don't want to get this blood done anymore I'm going to die soon anyway and I want my last you know few months to be pleasant without having to go for dialysis every day so in that case they give up available treatment um, a cancer patient who decides not to continue with chemotherapy because they realize at this point they're not going to get better that would be passive euthanasia now passive euthanasia is legal pretty much everywhere around the United States Active euthanasia, mm, that one is a little bit more questionable on if you are allowed to do that or not. Now, a lot of people will go ahead and do active euthanasia anyway. Basically, they'll save up medicine. They'll do other things that will help them pass away. But it isn't legal in all the states. Which brings us to physician-assisted suicide. Now, Oregon and Washington were sort of the first two states, and I believe there's some more states since then that have done this. Now, what we talk about with physician-assisted suicide is that you had to have a terminal illness, and basically it has to be by more than one person who has determined this. So it's sort of like one person doesn't make a mistake and tell you you're terminally ill and, you know, then you go to another person who says, oh, no, it's not really that. We can do something for you. So it's not so easy to actually get into a physician-assisted suicide um, situation. So what we do know is that generally it requires that you have two oral requests and it has to be separated by 15 or more days. You have to make a written request and you also have to be declared mentally competent, which means that I can't go in and say, hey, grandma's really bad and I think that you know we should assist her in suicide. Um, nope, not going to work. The person has to request it themselves. Now, some people can request it early on so that as they get worse and they become to the point where they can't perhaps make an oral request, the request is already there. So again, people with bone cancer may get to the point where they can't even hardly speak. Um, but you also have to give the person the right to self-administer the dose. Basically, somebody else can mix up the dose for you, but you have to have enough strength to administer to yourself. And there's all kinds of devices that are used for that. There's questionable about that too as far as are we making people perhaps um, euthanize themselves earlier because they're afraid that they won't be strong enough later on but this is not a class to debate those type of things more states in Oregon and Washington have allowed these types of situations also do understand because Florida is a very international area with our tourism that assisted uh, physician assisted suicide which is what we call it um, is not uncommon in the world. In fact, we tend to, in the United States, view it much less as an option than other places. Many countries have very dedicated programs, like we have a hospice program. They have programs assisted 
uh, for uh, this type of situation where they have doctors and nurses who are all set up. They have whole care systems for this. Um, some people can, in some countries, they even have locations where let's say that I've decided that I've always wanted to see the ocean or the sunset over the ocean when I died. And they literally have homes where a person can go and, and have this. They almost always have doctors or a physician or a nurse or someone who's on staff there so that when the dose is administered, they can make sure that it goes correctly. Generally, funeral arrangements have already been made, so the funeral director is already there. And the family does little to nothing except for be there for the person who is dying and for each other. There's people already around to take care of all the other aspects of that. So in the United States, it's a little bit different. Um, don't be surprised if you're dealing in a hospital setting where people are asking for those types of services if it looks like that person is going to be close to death. Um, it is just simply culturally a different way to view death. Now, what is interesting is that through our lives, we're going to look at death differently. So when we go um, from formal operation, and remember, according to Piget, this is when we have abstract to our post-formal post operation. This is when we are in our young adult. We tend to get more emotional about death. Um, in our formal operation, it's a little bit more abstract. We've got the concept of it. Um, in concrete operational, um, death is death, and they can sometimes be what we might feel very cold, but it's not that as much as it's much more black and white. Dead is dead. The dog is dead. That's it. And in the formal operation, they suddenly go, dog is dead. Do they go to heaven? Do they get all these wonderful things? You know, what happens to them? And post offer post formal operational, more of these thoughts of our even our own death may begin to occur. Now, as we get older, and we call these death trajectories, um, different things can help us sort of begin to deal with one's own death and begin to think about one's own death. Now, what's interesting is, is that there's sort of two ways of looking at this. Diseases such as cancer, which have terminal phases, and we know that death is coming to us, quite often help us as patients or as the, the person who's dying actually prepare for death. It helps the family prepare for death. Um, a survey taken not too long ago looked at which ward in a hospital is the least stressful ward to work on. And oncology actually turns out to be one of the least stressful for nurses, primarily because it isn't an instant death. People know it's coming. Sometimes you get to know the patients, you get to know the families. And as you work through the process, there's... Uh, sort of an acceptance of this process and acceptance of the death coming. Whereas other ones in which the death could occur at any time, heart attack, tend to be much more stressful for people because when Johnny left, he was perfectly fine and now Johnny is dead. We didn't have any time to prepare for this. The families are much harder to um, accept and deal with this because they didn't have that time to adjust. It can also be much harder on the nursing staff because these patients are often asking questions like, why did it happen? Could we have done something else? Blah, blah, blah. Whereas with the cancer or the, the longer term deaths, we've had that time to sort of work our way emotionally through those aspects. One of the sort of leaders you might want to say in looking at death is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Now, what's interesting is, is it depends on sort of what you read about Kubler-Ross and how old it is on how people view it. Um, I think our book talks about her stages of dying. Um, what is interesting is that as she moved on further, it wasn't so much about the stages of dying, and you'll see in the next slide, it's really more about the stages of grief that she talks about. The interesting thing that is, is that up until she came along, nobody really looked at dying people. Now, what she did is she did these interviews with terminal patients. Sometimes they didn't know they were terminal. But what she did find is that there were five distinct emotional reactions. Quite often, these are taught as if everybody has to go through each one of these in exact order. Um, the truth is, is that you that she did not believe that. She did not believe that everybody went through all of these. They didn't go exactly in this order. What she did produce is what she thought was the most common order. Um, what I say for the students who are going to go into nursing, learn the order and 
learn it in a kumbaya way, those something that you do need to know for your um, exams and nursing. But in principle, it doesn't mean that it has to happen in the order that we're going to talk about. So the Kubler-Gross grief cycle, which is what it's really much more considered these days, um, is that we will start with sort of a denial. And what we're talking about is sort of an informational communication aspect of the grief process right here. And that's what we're seeing down here is that in this section right here, what the person who is dying or his family members first may be, no, this is not right. This can't be true. Um, I, I don't believe it. Now, what we do want is for people to get a second opinion. We never want someone to not get a second opinion, but at the same point, they've got to get out of denial because if they keep denying, then they're not going to be able to work through sort of this process. And the second one that she tended to find happen as we're going down in sort of this uh, grief cycle is anger. We get frustrated, we get anxious, we, we're just pissed off. Then we get down to sort of this area right here we call bargaining and we really need is more emotional support and the bargaining is trying to find meaning and tell one's story and make connections. Um, quite often bargaining may also be where you see people saying if I can live just to do this or if I can just reach this or I just want to get to my son's graduation or I just want to see my daughter get married. I mean how many times have you heard about somebody who dies right after or right before some major event in the family's life. And that's sort of the bargaining phase. It's they're helping themselves get there, but they need a lot of emotional support. That emotional support really does continue through sort of the depression stage. Now, depression is the one that probably shows up most often in different locations. Um, quite often, after we make the bargain, we can get a little depressed, um, overwhelming this, um, hostility, which is why sometimes we really see that bargaining will kind of fall over here um, also. But depression is not uncommon. Now, what Kubler-Ross found was that people who were able to get to acceptance, basically we explore our options, we're ready to move on, not that we're ready to die, but we've kind of accepted that we're going to die. Then what we're really finding is people who are not satisfied with life, but they're having an easier time transitioning. And so is the family. So I always like to tell the story of my friend who died of breast cancer. Unfortunately, she had it twice. And the first time around, she battled it, fought it. Um, you have to go five years to be considered to be cancer free. Four and a half years in, it comes back and it came back roaringly. It didn't just a little bit. So we think it may have been sort of inching back a little bit um, throughout those four years, but not caught. It had gotten up into the brain. So this time around, even though she was fighting a very hard battle, it did come down to the fact that she was not going to make it this time. The cancer was going to be overwhelming, but yet her birthday was coming up. And so she had accepted that this time she wasn't going to make it through this, that you know, she wanted to have the quality of life she could have with her children. And she really did want to try to make it to her son's high school graduation. Um, but as her birthday came up, it was kind of a question of well, what do you do? She's dying. She's not going to be here for a second birthday. Do we celebrate it? Do we not? And so we talked to her. We said, you know, wh what would you like to do for your birthday? Pretty much you get anything you want this year. And she came up with, I thought, a really interesting thing. Um, and we'll talk about final scenarios. She said she wanted to have a celebration. She wanted it to be a huge celebration. And the theme was junk food. She said, it don't matter what I eat at this point. And so we had every kind of junk food you could think. We had an ice cream bar. We had chip bar. We had candy bar. We had cakes. We had pies. I mean, if you named a junk food, it was there. And we invited everybody and their brother. What you were to bring, though, was a photo of you and her if you had one and a story about that photo. And if you didn't have a photo of you and her, you were to bring just a written little story about something she and you had done together. And when they arrived, the guests, there were all these, um, I'm gonna say cardboards, but they're things like you have for science projects and you were to post them on one of those boards. And those boards went to her children so that after she died, her children would have 
all these wonderful stories about her that she wasn't going to be able to tell. And we put them sort of in, in age groups, you know, her teens, her 20s, and, and this on. Now, this turned out to be one of the most fun things that I can remember doing because she had accepted it. And so people coming in, she knew this was going to be the last time she was going to see many of them. And for many of them, it was going to be the last time they saw her. But it was a very friendly atmosphere and lots of people were seeing people they hadn't seen in a long time. And people didn't stay for, you know, terribly long times, maybe a half an hour, but they were required to eat something junky. Even the most fit person had to eat something junky. And we laughed, we cried. It was a wonderful time, but she had come to acceptance. And that's what Kubler-Ross said. If you can get somebody to that point, if we can help with their emotional support and the guidance, then we get to acceptance and sort of, we know this is going to happen, but it doesn't happen out of fear. It doesn't happen out of anger. It happens sort of with acceptance and in this plan to move on. So everybody got some closure that day. People who had only worked with her a little bit got an opportunity to come by. People who hadn't seen her in 10 years got to come by. And that is what she's talking about, that if we can get people to acceptance, that this grief that not only the dying person has, but also their family um, allows that opportunity of, uh, you want the best word I can say is closure. Which also then brings us to sort of death anxiety. Um, most people do have this fear of death anxiety and Freud and many psychoanalysts said that really this death anxiety is what tends to motivate us to keep us going. Um, because we have this fear, it's a primary motivator of all of our behaviors to try to keep us from dying. Now, when we're younger, yes, people take much more risks. And we've talked about younger people um, have less of aversion because they think of themselves as having lots of time. And of course, the older we get, then the less time we think we have. It is interesting that men have more fear, but women have more fear of the way they die. As somebody is dying, as I talked about a little bit with Kubler-Ross, what we know is that people will begin to make decisions about the formal management of what they want, not only with their body, but um, religious services and things like this. People in their head have sort of this final scenario. What, what's everybody going to do once I'm done? And the older we get, the more likely people will want to talk about that. It can be uncomfortable for others. But as I always tell people, my mother has, has threatened me. She said um, when she dies, she is to be buried next to her father and not her mother. And if I put her next to her mother, she's going to come back and haunt me. So, you know, people, they, they have a way in their head of what they see they want people to do. Um, and that's sort of this final scenario. So, you know, most of us kind of see something. Now, it does change throughout our lives quite often. What we see when we're younger may be different than as we get older. But we do tend to try to do what the person asks. So one of the questions is, is why is it that we try to accommodate this person who is now dead with their final scenario? And what research found is that the reason that we go out of our way to do these things, so somebody wants to have their ashes in Alaska, and we find some way to get there, is because in a way, what we want is for the next generation to do what we want. So if they can see that we're doing what the generation before wanted, if I take care of my parents the way my parents have asked me to take care of them, then my children will take care of me the way I've asked them. And so it becomes sort of this unwritten script that, you know, we have this responsibility to adhere to the person's last wishes if we want our own last wishes to be taken care of. We do have to talk about, and for most of you already know what hospice is. Um, hospice can be done in your own home. Hospice can be done at a nursing home. Hospice can be done in a hospice location. I've talked to many hospice nurses over the years, and they do say it's one of the most rewarding careers that they've had, as long as you have the ability to deal with death. Because let's face it, these people are going to die. But that you quite often become... Um, acquainted with the family. There's lots of good feelings of the help that you're giving to these families. So it is an area of nursing for many of you, you might want to look into. And for those of you who are going to go into health service administration, it may be an area that you want to look into as far as working, as long as you're comfortable with the concepts of death. <laughs> 
the other thing that your book goes into, and I think this is important that we understand, are how we make our intentions known for our end of life. Now, a living will is basically a statement of how you are willing to be kept alive. So I talked a little bit earlier about Karen Ann Quinlan. Now, Karen Ann Quinlan, as I said, was a young woman. She was in college, actually. She was very, very nervous. She had gone to her doctor and said, I'm having a lot of anxiety and a lot of nerves. I've moved away from home. And he, which was rather common at the time, gave her a prescription for tranquilizers. And so that night she was going to a party and she was very anxious. So she took the tranquilizers as she was supposed to she went to the party she had some drinks didn't get overly drunk had a few drinks but as we now know tranquilizers and alcohol do not go together and unfortunately she went into a vegetative state now her parents um, fought a great deal because she basically had no brain activity but she was being kept alive by machines and tubes and they kept saying this is not what Karen would want Karen wouldn't want to live like this Karen wouldn't want to live like this but yet they weren't allowed to turn off the machines because at that time that was considered to kill somebody and doctors had no permission to do that so they are the ones who went to court who fought for the right to be able to take the machines off of their daughter with the con with the caveat that if she breathe could breathe on her own then of course she would continue to breathe but if she didn't breathe then she would be passing away the way that nature had designed so from that moment on we basically had the concept of living wills now living wills are formal you need to get them done formally i would always make sure that you have them at all the hospitals and they're always ask about them the other one that people don't know a lot about is this durable power for health care now it's a power of attorney for health care in that there's a power of attorney and then there's a power of attorney for health care they are very different for the power of attorney of health care you're only talking about health care decisions whereas a regular power of attorney it's all decisions so make sure that if you go to do one of these that you get the one for health care um, my ex-husband was a paramedic and i always talk about this because of the many times he's had to deal with this anybody who's got kids there's a good chance that you do not have this durable power of health care of attorney for your children and you probably don't think much about it because you think well if something happens to me my husband or wife will go ahead and take care of the kids if there's uh, an accident of some sort but as he points as he would point out to me quite often in a car accident everybody was in the same car mom dad kids and the parents die or one parent dies in the car accident the other one is completely incapacitated and there's nobody available to make decisions for the children because the two adults that are directly related to those kids are incapacitated this can delay services to the children um, if you do have kids you really might want to think about getting one of these durable powers of attorney for health care with somebody who is not normally with you all the time um, after 9 11 this was also became an issue because a lot of people were not available um, so 9 11 happened and people had to go pick up kids and other things like this and it becomes a little bit of a mess we don't think about the fact that we may not always be available for our children you can make these very specific this is just sort of a general one right here um, you can even have how long before it kicks in and you can even say exactly what they can and can't decide um, you can have in there when it would actually no longer be valid so in my case when my child was younger I had one that said that if you could not reach me within 20 minutes that the durable power of health care would kick in and that once you did reach me that the durable power of health care no longer was valid so that way if anything had happened to me or I'm at school and you're unable to reach me my child isn't waiting for someone to be able to make it this health care decision now the other good thing about this especially if you have older parents and you can get durable power of attorney for health care is that if something does happen to the older parent you can begin to make some health care decision for them but you can also pay their health care bills which becomes an issue when they don't pay their bills so it would allow you to be able to go to the bank um, you have your durable power of health care attorney and you could show a bill and you could get enough money perhaps from their accounts to pay for those bills or that medication um, but you can be their advocate especially if they're not thinking quite straight because of certain medications that are 
kicked in at the time, but it is something you should look up. I do believe I have a link to one in our, our school here. Um, talk to, uh, you don't have to have a lawyer to fill one of these out. If you want to talk to a paralegal, that might be good too, but really consider to do that. Now, most people know what a do not resuscitate is, a DNR. The only thing I do recommend, again, this is from having a paramedic as a husband, is that you have to understand that each state has slightly different rules for how DNRs work, but understand that once a paramedic arrives at your door, if they start resuscitation, they cannot stop. The only one who can then stop would be the hospital. So if you have a DNR, you need to make sure that those DNRs are available and can be shown to the paramedic or to whoever arrives at the scene. Um, again, it varies state by state. Some states a photocopy would work. Some states a photocopy does not work. It has to be the original one that has basically a raised seal. So if you get a DNR, you can get more than one copy at that time with a raised seal. So you might want to get four or five. They're usually not much more money. They're usually like five bucks each. You want to make sure they're at their hospital not only at your home, but one of the things that I thought was interesting is that he always said you should have one in your car and you should label in your car where it is. So people at DNRs would have um, put DNR in glove box and they would look for the DNR. And if it was in there, they would not start the res resuscitation. But if they didn't see a DNR, even though the person was yelling, this person has a DNR, if they did not see it, they would start the recitation. And he said he couldn't tell me how many times people were yelling at them because they weren't supposed to do it, but they didn't have any paperwork that they shouldn't do it. So he had to start. So think about that you want to keep them at the locations that you are most likely to be at if you have a DNR or you know somebody who has a DNR. As far as grieving and mourning and bereavement are concerned, these three words really do talk about different states. So bereavement is the state that we're in. Grief is the actual emotion. And mourning is basically the way that we show grief. Now, what's mourning, what is interesting is, is that within a culture, we tend to show grief in the same way. So I have these three images down here. And the first one is after the Dayton, Ohio shooting. And you'll notice that there are lots of flowers and things left by the door. We see Colby Bryant after he died, people left flowers and things. And then the other one is Princess Diana. And while it's England, England is a lot culturally like us. And this is an image after Princess Diana's death. So this is sort of a way we show mourning. It's a way we show our grief quite often for, our, for unusual or people is through this process. Now, this is going to be different for different countries and different locations. Again, one thing I always like to point out is that we are a rather international area here in Florida. So when we have someone who dies who may not be from this country, understand they may show mourning in a different, we, a different way than we show mourning. However, grief will be pretty much the same around the world. And as you saw, grief eh, generally within six months is where it is the peak. But don't forget, it can last a lifetime. So let's talk a little bit more about the grief process and how we cope. Um, one of the things that can be really hard is to acknowledge the, the loss in reality. And one reason they say the grief is peaks at six months um, is that that's about when we sort of finally process that everything is, is done, all the loose ends have been tied up. It generally takes us a year for most of us to get through our first grief process. Um, the reason we say years, we got to get through that first Thanksgiving, that first Christmas, that first birthday, that first holiday. Two years sometimes also is common, but one to two years for most people um, is where our deepest grief and after that grief may linger off or grief may only happen on specific days. So if um, you had a mother who died, you may feel grief every time you reach her birthday. But on a day to day basis, after a while, that grief isn't there. So with grief, what we do know is that there's sort of five themes of, of grief. You know, how do we deal with people, how it affects us, how it changes our lives. Um, the narrative, I think this one's always interesting. The survivor's stories about the decrease, the decrease, the deceased. <laughs> um, 
so quite often when you have your wakes afterwards hearing those stories that people talk about and the kind of relationship that was there and the survivors tied to them these are the five sort of themes of grief as we move through that process so those of you who are going to go into psychology you'll study a lot more about this in your death and dying course for those of you who are in the mental um, in the physical health fields the clinical health fields understand that these are sort of the five things that you're going to see as you talk to the family members who are left over after somebody dies or is about to die don't forget grief isn't just after death because Kubler Ross noticed that people begin to go through the grieving process even as their loved one is beginning to die. Then we're going to look at, and your book sort of then tackles the grief process or um, with each generation. Now, this week I have asked you to go back and listen to a podcast that specifically does childhood. I really, really encourage you to listen to it. Um, you might need a tissue but it really tackles um, the issue of grief and childhood because they do go out to the sharing place which is a grief support group for children and to actually hear children talk about it now one of the things that people tend to think is that preschoolers don't understand death and we do know that they understand death but they may think of death as being temporary sometimes you hear them say well they think death is magical and, and we don't really mean magical what they may not understand because remember if we're talking about preschoolers these are pre-operational people um, the complexities of death so if we've talked about going to heaven heaven seems magical it's like this magical place um, we see TV shows where uh, things have gotten hurt and comes right back um, they may not understand the finality of death is what it is also as we know that children um, who are grieving they tend to grieve in fits and spurts meaning is is that you know when you have a five-year-old uh, the most that they may be able to grieve about that death is five or six minutes and then they go playing for five or six minutes and then they grieve again for a little while they don't grieve like adults do which is constantly and all the way through so she said pre-operational they'll tend to be thinking everyone's sort of thinking the same thing and they ask you don't understand sometimes why when they say hey let's go play and you say no I can't I'm too sad they don't understand why you're sad because they're not sad at the moment and then a few minutes later they come out and they're very very sad and maybe you're cooking dinner and they're like why can you be cooking dinner you you, you're sh you should be sad because they're sad now so it's a little bit harder sometimes for adults for these for us to go with our kids um, as far as their pattern is concerned because it's more of a fit and stop where with adults it's going to be more steady the other thing is is that there's a shift between the children who are in pre-operational versus the concrete operational thoughts I mean the concrete operational thoughts are much more black and white you know dead is dead and they'll equate the death of their cat and the death of their father almost in the same way um, the older we get generally the better we are at coping things um, meaning is that we have a we, we have a sense of control over ourselves in the first place and so we have a better sense of what we may need to do to work through our grief where younger children may need more time to learn to work through their grief also as you will learn um, children will regrieve so if my mom let's say died when I'm young then as I hit these milestones in my life I quite often may regrieve because I would think when my mother loved me doing this oh, it would be so great if my mom was here for this I would really want to tell my mom how I had done that so this regrieving process quite often happens and people don't always understand why when the mother may have died when they were six or seven and now they're 26 and they're regrieving they're like basically haven't you gotten over it and it's not that as much as they grieve the fact that that person isn't there to experience these things with them so that grief will come back and remember we said everybody grieves differently so if we get into adolescence what we do find and remember adolescence is between 12 and 20 years old that most have already experienced some death either a family member or a friend quite often a grandparent by now has died um, this first experience of death can be 
severe if they it, it's unexpected if we know a grandparent is sick we've gotten time to kind of come to it but if it's a sudden death then that may be much harder for them especially if they are that younger adolescent so let's say that 10 to 14 year age and they lose a parent there what's interesting is is not only do they uh, sort of cling to their parent but their friends now have experienced that death up until then I may not have thought about the fact that my parent could die and now my best friend's parent has died and I may feel grief for not just my best friend's parent who I know but I suddenly become very aware of the death of my own parents and may become a little bit more clingy or a little bit more where are you going you can't do that that's dangerous because I hadn't really thought about the death of their own parent until this occurs so it is very interesting on seeing how people of the younger adolescent age handle this it's also one of the reasons why they have grief counselors at schools after the death of somebody in the school because the grief that somebody may be feeling may not be about the death of the person who died at school but may actually be about the fact that they finally understand what death really is because remember until we have abstract thought you know, a lot of this is very iffy and even the concrete people um, may they, they may not be quite emotionally there and so it's a little bit harder for them to process but if they do process it then they may develop a lot of fear all of a sudden about other people dying because they hadn't really thought about it before in adulthood um, we do know that we have a slight difference in viewing it as a young adult versus an older adult as a younger adult we quite often think that um, especially if the person who dies is a younger adult uh, they've been cheated out of life they had so much more to do we quite often don't feel that way about grandparents who've had a good and long life because we have accepted for most of us that death is part of life but we feel like you shouldn't die until you've had this nice long life so as we see younger people die or we see somebody maybe even their 30s die we can feel that that person's been cheated but losing a partner when you're younger is actually a little bit more difficult than losing your partner when you're older it is this sort of quite often unexpected grief but also it can take a much longer time for that person to get over that grief or basically I don't want to say get over but move beyond that grief within their lives so you may see somebody who's 40 who loses a husband or a wife and you know within a year or two they're out dating again and doing things whereas you see somebody who's 28 or 31 who loses a partner they may not be ready to date again for five or six years because they're still dealing with the grief of that connection with that person with the death of one's own child meaning is that you're an adult but your child has died it's pretty simple this grief may never go away this grief and mourning is so intense that we know it quite often lasts a lifetime what we have to also understand is that this grief process not only holds for a child that we have lost who is alive but it can also hold for miscarriages it can also hold for stillbirths um, it can even happen when you have been given the wrong gender for a child so let's say you went in you had a sonogram and you were told um, that uh, you're gonna have a boy in your head what's happened is is you've gone home and you have a whole life planned out for this boy you know here's Jack and when Jack is born we're gonna have all this stuff and he's gonna play t-ball and then we're gonna do this with Jack and we're gonna do that with Jack and then you go back a month later and they do an x-ray and they go oh I guess that was a pinky not a penis and Jack is really a girl and so now Jack has become Emily and people don't always understand that there's a morning for Jack see Jack was real in their head Jack was somebody who they were going to have a life with and it's not that they don't love Emily and it's not that they don't want a girl it's just that they've lost Jack and so there may be that period of time where they're sad about that and they're not sad about having a girl they're sad because they've lost Jack in fact many people say that once they have in their head sort of had the scenario of who Jack is all that that if their second child is a boy they can't name him Jack because Jack is gone 
Jack died in a way. This also happens to parents who are going to adopt a child, by the way. They have this whole adoption all set up. They've got this whole thing in their head, exactly how it's going to be. They may have even set up a nursery room, and then the adoption falls through, or the parent, the biological parent, um, decides to keep the child. They will also go through a mourning period of a loss of a child. You can talk to them 10 years later, even if they've adopted another child. They will still talk about the child that they lost because that was their child in their head. They had this child, they were raising this child and they wanna know what happened to that child. So there's still a loss, just like somebody who may have biologically had a child um, who died in, in, in utero. The death of one's own parent can lead to different types of emotional stress for ourselves. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, when your parent dies, what's been lost is sort of this support and guidance system that you think of. I've heard 60 year olds who've lost both of their parents, maybe one a little earlier, one a little bit later. And when the second parent dies, they'll look at me and say, I'm an orphan now. And you don't think of six year olds as being orphans, but they are because they no longer have any parents alive. And there is quite often this struggle of what do I do now? Who do I turn to? You know, wh where am I going to go? Because no matter how old you are, your parents have always been older and had more experiences and things. Um, six year olds who have 80 year old and 85 year old parents will still talk to them and say, Hey, you know, what would you think? Blah, 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 blah. And that person isn't there anymore. So that loss is very significant. That second parent loss. It is interesting that some social scientists have found that men, um, who lose their mothers is the hardest loss of all the different combinations we can think of with parents. And that's primarily because men have depended quite often on their mothers as being the emotional support in their life. They're the place who I can go and talk about feeling bad about something or uh, feeling anxious, you might want to say. I may not want to tell my dad this. I may not want to tell my friends this because that might make me look a little less strong than I am. But my mom, I could always tell. And so when the mother dies, they've lost perhaps their one emotional support that they had where they felt comfortable to be able to express their feelings in a very um, non-judgmental place. It doesn't mean that, that daughters don't feel the death of their mothers as much. It's just kind of interesting in that it may be actually a little bit harder for the sons to, to come over that grief. Um, this last thing when it talks about Alzheimer's, what social psychologists have also found is that as parents or as a parent um, goes further into the Alzheimer's disease, we as the the children of, of those people quite often begin to see that or view them as not being there anymore. They've that isn't my mother anymore. That isn't my father anymore because the person unfortunately does have such great dementia. But then when they die, they actually die we kind of grieve again because we've already grieved the fact that we've lost who we think of as our parent and now the parent is actually dead. So it is um, an area of social psychology that is studied quite a lot and it does really vary from person to person how we view the death of one's own parent. Also the age we are as far as the death of one's parent also makes a huge difference. For those who are studying psychology you'll have a whole course called Death and Dying where you'll study the more interactions and dealing with um, these sort of issues with your clients. That brings us then to late adulthood. And notice I didn't say seniors. Um, late adulthood, we're basically talking about people who now are pretty well established. They tend to have less death anxiety, primarily because they've experienced death of friends at this point or family members. It's very rare for someone to get to be an older adult and not have had some sort of an experience with death within their community, whether it is a family member a fellow co-worker, even people in the community. Coping skills quite often have been developed at this point, and the coping skills of how to deal with um, the feelings they may have have been developed. So we have this ability to accept it. Not only that, but as we get older, we begin to accept that death is part of the landscape of life. There is birth and death and everything in between, you might want to say. So it is sort of more that acceptance that death happens, not so much my death, as much as death within life happens.
The death of one's own child or grandchild in lighthood, though, is handled a little bit differently. The biggest problem that um, you might want to say that we have to deal with, those of you who are going to psychology especially, um, and those who are going into the medical field, is that when there's a death of a grandchild, the grandparent quite often hides their grief. Why? Because their primary focus is on their child. Their child is still alive. Their child is grieving the death of their ch of the grandchild. And so they don't want to bring any more stress to their own child. So if they don't have a safe haven to be able to express this grief, if they don't have some place where they can express and and bring this grief out, it quite often can affect them negatively as far as their physiological concern is there. So if you happen to have a neighbor who you hear um, their grandchild has died, perhaps you can spend a few minutes with them so they have someone to talk to about this because they've hidden it quite often from their own family, especially from their own child. Well, that brings us to the end of this course. So if you have finished listening to this, hopefully you will go on to the last week of class. There are student evaluations generally for you to take. Please take those and then you can celebrate and reflect because you're just about ready to take exam for the last exam of the class. I hope you've enjoyed these and if you need me, there's my email address as usual.